uh, first got interested in going to Fort Davis because a friend of ours uh, with whom we'd done some parades down in Galveston for the, uh, uh, the Dickens on the Strand celebration in December, it kept inviting us to come out to Fort Davis and, and uh, ride in the 4th of July parade out there. And we finally got around to going and I found out that's the one place in Texas that you have to wear a jacket on the morning of the 4th of July. Um, but we got fascinated with uh, the uh, fort. In fact, uh, the National Park Service had purchased the fort at that time and was rebuilding the fort. Uh, this goes back into the 1990s. And now, uh, to a large extent, the fort has been reconstructed. So it's a great place to go. Uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about, you have to remember, we've now got Interstate 10 and the Infernal Combustion Engine. And it's a lot easier to get there, but it's still pretty remote. From here, it's about nine hours. Wow. Hard driving. In the 1850s, it was no I-10. <laughs> and hard writing. <laughs> so you can just imagine how remote that post was at that time. Anything else I need to bring up? Okay. <clears throat> this, by the way, this is a team presentation. Sally and I have worked together on this. She's sort of the silent partner. Uh, she actually found some of the books that I've used to research the topic, and, uh, and she's my uh, projectionist. <laughs> so she, she'll be doing, <clears throat> excuse me, putting the slides up. I'm going to have to pick this thing up. <clears throat> so my question is, what do a Civil War, Civil War hero, an ex-slave, and an Indian chief have in common with a tiny town in far west Texas? The Buffalo Soldiers. That's the answer. Now, <laughs> we have to kind of get into this a little bit. You know, it's interesting that uh, Nowadays, the United States Army, in fact, all the United States military, is completely integrated. Uh, you have African American and Caucasian soldiers working side by side, just like there is no difference, because there is no difference. Uh, as a physician, I'm here to tell you, when you get past the first millimeter of skin, we're exactly the same. <laughs> and there's many times that I wished uh, that I had a lot more melanin in my skin because I'm starting to get these skin cancers, you know. And you, so it would be pretty nice if we had a little more pigment. Anyway, uh, the, the Negro soldier, as they were called back in the Revolutionary War, fought in George Washington's army. There were uh, units uh, essentially in, in every war that's happened since then. In fact, uh, they call Black Jack Pershing that because he had, he had control of an African-American unit in the war in Mexico. But the Civil War, there were a lot of the African-Americans in this country were still slaves. The, the war was partly about slavery, but also partly about economic issues. But the, the slaves and ex-slaves in this country <laughs> of course lined up with the United States Army uh, during the Civil War. And many, many times there were actually units, in fact, uh, there are stories about these units that were entirely Negro units that fought in the Civil War, and, and very courageously and very honorably, I might add. One of the people who believed in this was a man from Ohio, he was a son of uh, Irish immigrants, born in Pennsylvania, grew up, became a music teacher, and as the Civil War broke out, he was a great admirer of Abraham Lincoln, and he believed in the Union. He felt that the United States should be one country. It's stronger as one country, and it looked like it was going to break up. So he volunteered. This guy's name was Benjamin Grierson. This is a picture of him here. Volunteered to join the United States Army. <clears throat> Even though he had been kicked in the head by a horse when he was eight years old and he really didn't like horses very much, and he volunteered to join the infantry, he got assigned to the cavalry <laughs> in the inimitable wisdom of the United States Army. Uh, he, uh, he became a cavalry commander in the Western Theater, uh, assigned there by the next slide, William Tecumseh Sherman. Sherman became one of his great advocates. They were great friends. He and Ulysses S. Grant were the, the men who ran the, the Civil War in the Western Theater. They had to control the Mississippi River ports in order to try to shut down the rebel army from that aspect. 
it's kind of difficult to talk about in, in, in some ways because because if you grow up in the South, you see yourself as one of the rebels. <laughs> Although, I must say, it's like the fellow that wrote the book Gettysburg, thank God Lee, who was one of my heroes, lost at Gettysburg because we are now the greatest country in the world. Whoop! <laughs> All right, so this guy, as he volunteers, for the army, he's, remember he's a music teacher, okay? He goes to the library, he checks out, and you can imagine how few books there were on military strategy in those days. They didn't have the internet. He studied up on military strategy, became one of the best cavalry commanders in the Western theater of the Civil War. This is called Grierson's Raid. It's kind of hard to see what's going on there, but basically the Mississippi River is that wavy line to the west, and he started out uh, up near Memphis, and raided down into Mississippi and Louisiana, sometimes traveling 50 miles a day, this guy that didn't like horses, horseback, with a cavalry unit, no wheels, no wagons, all mounted, every soldier carrying their own stuff. And he discovered in his, in his studies, know your enemy, know the land, live off the land, move fast, live light, destroy uh, things like uh, supplies, trans, uh, uh communications, arms, not people. He says, these are my countrymen. I don't want to kill a bunch of people, but I want to make it impossible for them to continue this war. So he, tear, he tore up railroad tracks, he tore down telegraph lines, he burned boot factories, he blew up ammunition dumps all down through Mississippi. Uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the, the great cavalry commander of the South, never could really engage with him successfully. He was always moving too fast. He would also, uh, when he came into plantations and so forth, he would commandeer the, the, the food, the goods, the, the horse feed of the plantation and feed his troops and take care of his soldiers. And many times the slaves on these plantations would follow him. So he actually became a commander of African-American troops early on, even in the Civil War. And they actually, they liked him and they worked with him and he liked them. He thought they were good soldiers. They had several uh, things that he really liked. He also, so he recruited the, the locals as much as he could, kind of like Alexander the Great, you know, recruit the locals, okay? Uh, he also believed in scouting, sending people out to find out what's going on ahead of you. And I guess the only word I can come up with is obfuscation. He would leave a town headed south. After he's out of town, turn around and go north so that everybody in the town, when Forrest's troops would come in, say, well, they headed south. He says, well, so Bedford Forest heads south. Grierson's going north. <laughs> so these are some of the military strategies that he carried with him uh, when in 1866, when the war was over, everybody thought everything was done. We don't need to do any more army stuff. So he mustered out. Well, J.P. Morgan and others began to take Horace Greeley's advice. Now remember, California came into the United States in 1850. This is 1866. We've got to get in touch with the western part of the United States. Uh, so we're gonna build railroads. Here we got the guys building railroads out through Kansas. This is how the cattle get back to the United, to the, now the United States uh, from Texas. The, the thing that's going on at the same time is the Texas cattle drives. Starting to drive cattle from right here up to Kansas to get on the railroad, okay? And wagon trains. We got wagon trains heading west uh, to settle Oregon, California, all out in there. Uh, meanwhile, what's going on in the eastern United States is reconstruction in the south and one of the most severe economic depressions a country has ever known. So, and let's see, we got some more maps here. So, okay, here goes the wagon train. Notably, in this slide, you look on the other side of the wagon train, see there's a column of soldiers over there? If you look real closely, those soldiers are African-American soldiers. They're guarding the wagon trains. This is a scout up here in front. So that's the first thing. Why did they have to guard the wagon trains? Well, the country that they were moving into was already occupied. This, uh, the Louisiana Purchase and the Mexican Session and all that kind of shows you where, where they were headed. And this so shows how the territories were divided up. That green one kind of right in the middle is Oklahoma. In 1838, all the Cherokee Indians had been transported from, well actually walked, the Trail of Tears, from Tennessee and North Carolina to Oklahoma. So the idea was we're gonna put the Seminoles, the Cherokees, the Creeks, Choctaws, all those guys, we're gonna put them in Oklahoma. Well, meanwhile, 
Every little dot that you see on that map through the central portion of the United States is an Indian tribe. Notably for our discussion from around Kansas south, it's, it's Arapaho, Cheyenne, uh, Chir um, Comanche, and Kiowa. So those are the four ma major tribes of the southern portion of the Great Plains that we were having to deal with, and there's nobody to do it. The soldiers are, 600,000 of them were killed off during the war. So what are we gonna do? Well, Congress commissions uh, four Negro troops, the 24th and the 25th Infantry, and the 9th and the 10th Cavalry. So who's gonna lead them? Ah, got a guy named Hatch and a guy named Grierson who worked with Negro troops during the Civil War, and they liked the troops. Let's sign them up. So Grierson gets signed up to be the, the regimental commander for the 10th Cavalry. And now we got soldiers. Well, kind of a long story, he had to recruit soldiers and he got all kinds of people, people that were too old to fight and that sort of thing, along with horses that were too old to fight, equipment that was worn out and so forth. But he goes out to uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas and starts to recruit. Now, we got a chance for these guys to make themselves into something that they want to be. They want to be Americans, they want to be free men. So they're gonna, they're gonna get a chance to do that they come with a, a skill set that, that gives them great advantages because many of them on the plantations were the horse breakers on the plantations. They also, you see this guy's carrying a rifle. In many cases, even though slaves were not allowed to have firearms, in many cases they would get a hold of a 22 or something like that. And even though the plantation owners didn't really provide much in the way of food and so forth, they would augment their diet by hunting rabbits and birds and this sort of thing. And so some of them learned that, like my father taught me, one bullet, one shot, one game. Yeah, so they got pretty good with their rifle. So we've got some skills. They also wanted some other things, <laughs> one of which was due to the economic con condition of the country at that time, it was pretty hard to find a paying job anywhere. And even though they only got paid $10 an hour as, a, as opposed to the white soldiers, $13, uh, not an hour, a, a month. <laughs> My, how times have changed. <laughs> $10 a month, imagine that, as opposed to the $13 a month that the white soldiers would get, but they at least got a paycheck. And to kind of add one little extra thing on top, which was really a goodie, the, each cavalry company was assigned a chaplain. And they, okay, big deal, you know. Well, it is a big deal because chaplains are educated people. They know how to read, write, and do arithmetic. Most of these ex-slaves, because of the way the laws in the South were at that time, were illiterate. So they had the opportunity to learn how to read and write and cipher. One big advantage, probably everybody in this room already knows how to do that, and you don't realize what a tremendous advantage that is in life. So anyhow, those were some of the things that these guys could, uh, could gain from that. Now there's two movies, I don't have a picture of the other one, but this is Danny Glover's movie, The Buffalo Soldiers. If you haven't seen that, it's a wonderful movie. Also, Glory, which was about a cavalry, the 54th Massachusetts in the Civil War. Uh, uh, Robert Shaw was their commander. They were essentially all killed in the attack on Fort Wagner. But the, the significant thing there was these soldiers were also given that same offer and they said, if we're not gonna get paid the same thing as the white soldiers, we just don't need to get paid at all. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they refused to get paid, and they continued to wear the uniform and fight and get killed in the Civil War. Shaw, seeing that, tore up his paycheck. So that pretty emotional um, situation tells you how these people felt about their African-American troops. So we're putting together the troops. This is kind of what a cavalry unit looked like when they got put together at Fort Leavenworth. The problem at Fort Leavenworth was that, that Sheridan, who was the, the overall commander of that fort, didn't really like the idea, he was pretty racist, and he didn't like the idea of black troops being next to his white troops. So Grierson says, okay, let's just put them together and move them faster. He had one unit, I think it was uh, Company I, was put together in two weeks. Now if you can imagine a military unit put together and moved out in two weeks, that's what he did. They moved out to Fort Riley and Fort Hayes and other places in Kansas. And here's some of the, uh, the troops in their formal attire. Pretty neat outfits actually. These are some of the NCOs. This is non-commissioned officers like sergeants uh, who would be the commanders within the companies. And then, of course, the uh, 
soldier himself, and this gives you an idea, it's kind of a little hard to see, but this is a, an actual buffalo soldier on his actual buffalo soldier horse, okay? This was taken at the time, so this is period. You notice uh, up there he's got a rifle, that's a, a Spencer 4570. Basically, that's a cannon. <laughs> if you've ever fired a 45 caliber anything, that's a whale of a rifle. On his other side is a six caliber Colt, I mean a six shot 45 caliber Colt, and there's a saber hanging on the other side. Notice all this stuff hanging behind him. That's his groceries and his bed. Uh, er everything he needs is on that horse. And when Grierson moves out, he's got a bunch of these guys, and they're all they're all uh, fixed up that way. So they don't need supply wagons. They can move fast. They don't outrun their supplies, okay? Got a question back there. Tell us about the horse he's on. Okay, the horse was in many cases, uh, Grierson would go back to St. Louis to recruit recruits that came from all over the country, basically, and also to buy horses. Uh, this was before the cavalry remount. So he would get horses that had been cavalry horses. He would get horses off of various farms and ranches and so forth. Many of the horses that he would get in weren't serviceable. And in fact, when, when the cavalry went through the horses, they would take the good horses and go to Custer's 7th Cavalry or to Miles, uh, I think it was the 4th, and then uh, Mackenzie's 8th. And then what was left over went to the Buffalo Soldiers. So these guys are working with old worn out equipment, old worn out horses. <laughs> I mean, they, it, it's kind of like they say, we've been doing so much for so long with so little that we're now qualified to do everything with nothing. <laughs> That's the Buffalo Soldiers motto, I think. <laughs> So, uh, so now we're moving out, and, and what, uh, yeah, okay, the, if you go back to the other slide, this, this, I want to kind of get the effect of this. Okay, okay. moving out into Kansas to, to deal with the Indians, many times you try to find the enemy, and he's nowhere to be found, and you'd be riding along sometimes 50 miles a day. In fact, they used to say 40 miles a day on nothing but beans and hay. And, and you're riding out through the Great Plains, there's nothing to see, there's just grass, and it's like hours and hours of sheer boredom punctuated by moments of stark terror. Because when you found them, they came up all at once, and there were more of them than there were of you. A lot of times it would be a cavalry company of 80 and, and a, an Indian group of maybe 1,000. I mean, the, the odds were just incredibly stacked against them. The only thing that they had in their favor, remember we said they used to hunt rabbits? They knew that you aim at something and you shoot it a long ways away from you. The Indians used the rifle kind of like a modified coup stick. They'd run up and start blasting with it. They weren't necessarily aiming, so you really had a pretty fair chance that they wouldn't hit you from a distance or from up close. So actually the, the battle was some, some fairly well-trained Negro soldiers fighting with some fairly undisciplined Indians who outnumbered them, but the technique that they were using was better. That's kind of an interesting thing, I think. So, so here we go, we see them, they're out there. This, by the way, that picture was a picture of, of Company A of the 10th Cavalry. That was a painting, but it was actually the people that we're talking about. Here's the other people we're talking about. This is a group of Kiowa, Comanche, Arapaho, or Cheyenne, I, I don't know which, but they're returning from a buffalo hunt. The buffalo to them was everything. In fact, that's kind of how the Negro soldiers got the name Buffalo Soldiers. The, the buffalo was their lodging, the buffalo was their food, the buffalo was their tool. Everything the Plains Indian had basically came from the buffalo. They had tremendous, it was almost like a religious icon to them. When the Buffalo Soldiers showed up in the theater of operations, they noticed the similarity between the, the well, there's nothing up here, but anyway, the, uh, the, the kinky fuzz on the top looked kind of like the kinky fuzz on top of the buffalo. And they had tremendous respect for these soldiers because they knew that it was like grabbing a scorpion. When you get a hold of a Buffalo Soldier, you got yourself uh, a tiger by the tail. So they named them the Buffalo Soldiers. That came from the Indians. Here's, uh, uh, this is their equivalent of the suit and tie. They got the memo, memo and they got their feathers on and they're going to a meeting, what are we gonna do about these guys? The other thing that's going on that we gotta do something about is there are these civilian buffalo hunters coming out here by the thousands killing off the buffalo. If they take away our buffalo, that's like taking everything from our civilization away from us. We can't survive. So, so they go on a war path. This is a chief, and by the way, they had a pretty decent government. It was a very democratic government. 
Uh, this guy's got a wonderful war bonnet with eagle feathers, but uh, he was elected by the tribe. Tribes are small units. Groups of tribes would get together and form larger units. Uh, go on to the next thing. They had a, a form of mobile home that they used so that they could move from one place to the other pretty rapidly. It's called a teepee. Uh, I don't know where they got the poles. I guess they had to go all the way to the mountains to get the poles. But the skin comes off the buffalo. And that, that thing can be collapsed and, and loaded on a horse and in minutes they're gone. So uh, uh, an Indian tribe can move out pretty quickly. Now, when the tribes got together in August, they had a thing called the Sundance. And this was the great uh, gathering of all the tribes. So you might have tribes coming from as far north as the Dakotas, as far south as Texas, far west as, as Colorado, all coming together to Sundance. They had, this is, an initi this is the inside of the Sundance uh, Cathedral, and you see the sun pole in the middle, and these are the young men that are about to go through initiation. And we won't go into that, but it's pretty, pretty weird. Uh, but they also had weddings uh, and talked about what they're going to do in the year to come. One of which was what to do with the white man. <laughs> this guy is Lone Wolf. He is the one of the main war chiefs of the Kiowa, and this guy is somebody to look out for. He's a major military strategist who knows what he's doing. He hates white people. He hates the United States government. He hates everybody, and he's going to get them. And so he starts raiding all over that part of the country, stealing horses, so forth. His his uh, a lot of his tribesmen start being preyed upon by the whiskey runners and the gun runners. Incidentally, they got better guns than the cavalry. They got the Winchester 3030. But the whiskey came into, into play in that these guys, this is a couple of Comanches here, and this is a Coman another one to look out for. This is Quanah Parker. He's the war chief of the Comanche, the, the Quahati Comanche. So these guys are, are dealing with these, their troops are half the time drunk and making poor decisions but they, they know they got to get rid of the buffalo hunters and they got to get rid of the cavalry in order to stop this railroad, stop all these wagon trains from taking over their country. Meanwhile, and so here you see they're on the warpath. One of the things that happened on that warpath, they encountered at Adobe Walls up in the panhandle a bunch of buffalo hunters and tried to kill them all off. And a guy named Billy Dixon with his big 50, the buffalo gun, shot the medicine man that was starting a lot of this stuff uh, in the chest from almost exactly a mile away. That's kind of an interesting story in itself. <clears throat> well, th that didn't help anything because that just made them matter. <laughs> so after adobe walls, they started burning villages, stealing horses, stealing cattle, killing people. I mean, it was, it was really just out of control. So, enter, well, and yeah, here's another troop. I think these are Cheyenne. And we got a, another confab. We get together, what are we gonna do? So what we're going to do, the uh, United States comes in and says, okay, let's make a treaty. And they say, well, and the, the treaty process takes place over several years. Some treaties got made, many treaties got broken. The, the idea was to move all of these tribes into Oklahoma, which you know, is a fair amount of space, nothing like what they were used to. But Oklahoma was pretty nice, you know, mountains and grass, that sort of thing. But the problem was the, uh, the Quaker Indian agents were pretty good guys. They got to know the Indians. The, the Buffalo soldiers would be moved into units next to the reservation, so they got to know each other. So this is the, remember, know your enemy? So they got to know each other pretty well, but the problem was the government would not come through with the food. And this causes problems. And then Indians like uh, Satanta and Satank and Big Tree and Big Red Food and Buffalo Hump and, and uh, Lone Wolf and, and uh, Quanta Parker decide, you know, this is BS, we, we're supposed to be on this reservation and we're not getting what we're promised, so they take off raiding again. Now, this is an interesting picture. This is a painting of Buffalo Hump on his raid to the sea. They raided all the way from Oklahoma to the Gulf of Mexico, and in the, in the process uh, stole everything they could get their hands on, and it turned out they liked to wear women's clothes because it was kind of pretty. On their way back from the Gulf, they got stopped at, at Plum Creek down here by Lockhart, by uh, Edward Burleson and Matthew Caldwell. I live in Burleson County in the town of Caldwell, <laughs> Texas Rangers. And the guys were so encumbered by being drunk and dressed in women's clothes that they, <laughs> they couldn't fight very well. And the, the Texas Rangers ran them off. So the Comanches got actually defeated at Plum Creek, which is pretty close to here, actually. So anyway, I just thought that was kind of a funny little aside. 
So the Buffalo Soldiers are in the process of trying to track down and put on the reservation all these groups. And they would encounter a group, maybe 20 warriors, and they'd, they'd, uh, they'd catch them. They might have to kill some. They'd take them to the reservation, burn the teepees, burn the food. Same thing like Grierson learned back in the Civil War. He was teaching them how to do this. Take away their support. Take them to Oklahoma. And so they did this over and over again. And here's a, one of the campaigns in the Panhandle. Now, if you've been in the Panhandle, you know that those uh, nine counties that are shown there are nothing but absolutely dead, flat, short grass. There's nothing there except grass. <laughs> and, and, these, and no water, by the way. And these guys travel something like 50 miles a day. This, the, the, each of those arrows is about 50 miles. I measured it out. And that was one of the campaigns to try to find a particular Indian group out there. A lot of this was going on. We were forming forts down into Texas. You see up there Fort Griffin up, uh, it's near Albany, Texas actually, just a little bit north of Abilene. And that's where, from Fort Sill, Oklahoma to Fort Griffin was where the 10th Cavalry began to move in order to fight what was called the Red River War. You had uh, General Miles, General Custer, uh, General Ronald McKenzie, no, actually at that time it was Colonel Ronald McKenzie, and uh, Captain Davidson of the 10th Cavalry coming in from Fort Griffin, and they sort of formed a net and moved in on the Comanches and the Kiowas in the Panhandle. Okay, on the next slide. And here, one of the things I want to mention, here you see the Buffalo Soldier up on the rock there on his horse looking out, and down below you can barely make it out, but there's a kind of Indian looking dude down here looking for a track. Okay, this Indian dude, I mean from Native America, okay? <laughs> Native American. He's not from India. <laughs> this guy is a Tonkawa. Uh, the, the scouts for the, for the 10th Cavalry in North Texas were Tonkawa scouts, one of which was a guy named Johnson, just Johnson. He didn't have a first or last name, his name was Johnson. Six foot five, 260 pounds of mean Indian with his 20 scouts, and he might go out with 80 troopers and there'd be 20 scouts scattered out over miles and miles of country, and Johnson would be sitting with the, the cavalry captain, and they said Johnson could see Indian sign as far as, as it, the periphery of the earth, which is seven miles out there because it's flatter than a pancake. And, and so that, they had uh, a real scouting system. Remember, we go back to Grierson, scout, sent out scouts. Well, they had them. You, in the movies, you see like a scout, right? We're talking 20, <laughs> so it's a, it's a little different story than what we got in the movies, okay? Now, in, on 28th of September in, in 1874, I believe it was, Ronald McKenzie finds the entire nation of Kiowas and Comanches camped in the bottom of Paladero Canyon. Now, that's a pretty safe place to be, except that McKenzie figured out how to go down into the canyon. There was a narrow little trail, and they went down in the canyon. 400 cavalry troopers against 1,500 warriors, no telling how many women and children, no telling how many horses, mules, donkeys, what have you. Tents as far as you could see, well, teepees, as far as you could see. And they caught them in the morning before breakfast. The, the alert went up, but it was too late. Indians started escaping and running off. They, had, they didn't have an organized, uh, form of retaliation. At that point, McKenzie sent all the warriors he didn't kill to Oklahoma, killed all the horses, took all the women and children to Oklahoma, burned the teepees, destroyed all the food and supplies, and that was it. Basically, uh, September the uh, 28th of 1874 was the end of the Red River War, was the end of the Comanches, was the end of the Kiowas, everybody's on the reservation in Oklahoma. Cool, right? Well, not necessarily, <laughs> because we've got this little area down here called Fort Davis. They say, where is Fort Davis? Well, if you look, there's El Paso. There's the Big Bend. That little red star there is Fort Davis. It's right in the middle of an area that's occupied by the Apache Indian. The, there were several different bands of Apaches, but they, the, particularly the Mescalero Apaches and the, and the Lipan Apaches, thought that was their country. Well, guess what? The Overland Trail goes right through Fort Davis. Of course, at that time, uh, in the early days, there wasn't a fort. The first fort was built in 1854, before the Civil War. During the Civil War, the fort was allowed to kind of just go to a part. Uh, people stole parts out of it. And basically, by the time 
uh, Grierson's bunch gets there, there ain't no fort. There's just foundations. So the first job the Buffalo soldiers had to do on arriving at Fort Davis in order to deal with the Apaches who were attacking the overland trail and keeping us from being in contact with California was to build the fort. They also had to build telegraph lines, build roads, guard the Butterfield stage, which was carrying the mail, which took two weeks to get from St. Louis to California and back. Uh, various other, well, guard any settlers who happened to settle in that area from getting killed, and guards the stage stations. There were every 20 miles at water holes, more or less 20 miles, were these stations all along the Overland Trail, right through Fort Stockton, Wild Rose Pass, Olympia Creek, Point of Rocks, Barrel Springs, El Muerto, Van Horn's Wells, Rattlesnake, you know, these are the stage stations. They're still there, you can find these places. Sierra Blanca, right on out to a town called Franklin, which we now call El Paso. The Buffalo soldiers would go out and find the Indians when they could. They would also, Grierson had them detailed to go out and find the water holes, and this is a map made by the Buffalo soldiers. Down here in the right hand corner is Fort Davis, out there is El Paso, and they would make maps. Where's the water hole? Where's the mountain pass? Where are the Apaches? And they would, they would send detachments out to stay in these places. A lot of times you'd have four or five uh, buffalo soldiers or a little group out by a water hole someplace with their scouts or in a mountain pass, stay in there watching things and then reporting back. See these couple of guys. So they report back to this guy. This, this guy is a buffalo soldier of the 10th Cavalry reenactor at Fort Davis, and this is the standard uniform, the high top boots for the cactus, the riding pants, you see the, the, the uh, army regulation shirt and so forth. You see his pistol on his left and he's, he's still carrying that Spencer 4570, the blunderbuss, and, uh, and his slouch hat. They, they didn't wear helmets when they're out in the field. So, uh, and a lot of times, even in Fort Davis in the, in the far west Texas, you'd encounter some pretty bad weather rainy, cold, miserable weather, and you'd kind of build whatever kind of uh, contrivance you could to stay in, instead of being at this wonderful fort, which has got a roof, you're out there someplace. Now, sometimes the Buffalo soldiers would have wives with them. A lot of times the wives would be employed as laundresses, this sort of thing, there at the fort. So you got your, you got your husband, right? Except the problem is he's way off out there in the mountains someplace and you're here busting your buns, <laughs> washing laundry, you know, so the relationships were pretty strained and that's one of the things that you see in The Wolf and the Buffalo by Elmer Kelton. You got the kind of the story about how those relationships were, were pretty tough on some of them. So this is the fort today. Uh, it's been reconstructed now for the third time. It wasn't the Buffalo Soldiers, it was the National Park Service that reconstructed the fort. On your right you see the barracks, and on the left you see the officer's row, and in between is the parade ground. And here again, no more of the officer's row. The bachelor's uh, officer's quarters is that two-story building there. That's Sleeping Lion Mountain that you were looking at. Now you're looking from Sleeping Lion Mountain out towards the south, towards the, the mountains around Alpine. And there's another picture of the mountain, the, the officer's quarters across the parade ground. This is the barracks. And this is what the barracks look like on the inside. When you had the luxury of coming back to the fort, that's what you stayed in. Otherwise, you're out there where we saw those guys before. This is the officer's quarters. You see they're, you know, kind of nice little houses. Got a porch and everything. There's another view from the stables, which have not yet been reconstructed to the officer's quarters. And here's, uh, this is the 10th Cavalry mounted on parade in the parade grounds at Fort Davis. You can see Sleeping Lion Mountain back there behind them. And here's the, the, the entire regiment of the 10th Cavalry in parade. You see the officer over here to the right on his white horse, and then you see the black NCO, and then all the black cavalrymen on their horses. And then here's the, uh, I think this is the 24th Infantry in the same parade ground. They were, they were billeted together. In fact, at one time or another, the 24th, the 25th, the 9th, and the 10th were all at Fort Davis. That's how bad the Apache problem was. Here's Grierson again, looking a little bit older. He's trying to become a general. He's in charge of everything that's happening in West Texas. And uh, he brings his family out. This is Alice Kirk Grierson and uh, Charlie and John, his, two of his five kids that actually came out to the fort. Here we see they're trying to recreate a, a lifestyle. You know, you got the families and the kids playing around. 
uh, kids playing jump rope at the fort. That's the officers' quarters. And this is a photograph of probably in the 1890s with the wives out there having a little picnic out on the side of the mountain. You see the parade ground in the distance. They also tried to do plays and masquerade balls and this, just trying to live like normal people. Uh, here's the uh, parlor of Grierson's house, which has all been recreated and, and uh, all the, the furniture that they had put back in it. Notice the piano. How'd that get there? Carried in a wagon across these unbelievably rough roads. They actually made, Grierson, remember he's a music teacher, so he wants his family to have music. He got a, a fiddle and a guitar and a piano. So he's trying to recreate a decent American life for his family. And he had bands at every one of the forts that he populated. He would have these, uh, anybody, any of these ex-slave Buffalo soldiers who could play any kind of instrument, they'd put them together and they'd have a band. And these guys had some pretty good music at times. Here's the kitchen. They're outdoors because they use cactus for their fires. They don't want that inside the house, so the kitchens are outdoor kitchens. And you see in the middle there that ristra of chili peppers tells you they're gradually changing their diet to match the Southwest. <laughs> and here's the bedchamber, lamp, air, all's cool. You hear taps out in the parade ground. We're going to bed for the night Whew. until this guy comes along. This is Victorio, a 55 year Vet, well, actually, at that time, yeah, I guess he was a 45-year veteran of the Apache Wars. He was one of the main war chiefs of the Warm Springs, otherwise known as Chiricahua Apaches. Victorio was another one, probably one of the greatest military geniuses known to the world, uh, short of Alexander the Great. This guy could cover 50 to 100 miles a day with unshot ponies in rocky, cactus-ridden, mountainous country. He knew where the water holes were. He knew where you were safe and he knew how to get his warriors from one place to the other quicker than you could, except for Grierson, who, who had figured this game out a long time ago. So this is called Victorio's Raiding Range. He basically loved New Mexico. If you've been to central New Mexico, the San Andreas Mountains, the Mescalero Apache Reservation, it's absolutely some of those beautiful mountainous country you've ever seen in your life. It's heaven, and that's the way he felt about it. But where they wanted him to live was, well, it's not there. <laughs> on the other side of that dotted line that's straight up and down, hell is over on that other line. It's called San Carlos. There's nothing there but desert, nothing to eat, no water, nothing. And that's where they wanted him to stay. And he said, I'd stay in there. So he escaped from San Carlos at least five different times. And when he escapes, of course, he has nothing. He's got his troops with him. They might have a rifle or two. So they have to, they have to supply. So what do they do? Steal horses, one of their favorite sports. Steal mules, steal food, steal rifles, you know, steal everything you gotta have, and then take off. Well, Grierson's boys are out here mapping <laughs> the country. This is a map of the Big Bend done by one of Grierson's, or some of Grierson's troops, the Buffalo Soldiers. And they absolutely mapped this with, with unbelievable accuracy by using a wheel that had a counter on it and all these distances that they measured, they would measure with that wheel. So when they said we, we, tro we rode 50 miles on such and such a day, they measured it. It was, by golly, 50 miles. So you know, a lot of that stuff you think, oh, that's a big story. You know. No, it's the truth. Um, these are uh, Apache scouts. And the guy on the left is a Buffalo soldier. So this was actually pretty much of the, the time. That's what they actually looked like. Some of these guys, I don't know if the, any of these are, but many of the scouts that Grierson used in that area were Seminole scouts. Now I gotta back up a little bit. Back even before the Civil War, long before the Civil War, slaves would escape and go to Florida because you couldn't get them there. You know, the Everglades and all that, you, the army couldn't track them down, nobody could track them down. And there's already somebody in the Everglades called Seminole. It's a, it's a, a, uh, uh, a tribe of Indians that, that had adapted to that swampy, low-lying, mosquito-ridden, alligator-infested country and learned to live there and love it and do well and get educated and all that sort of thing. So these escaped slaves would go in, become a part of the Seminole tribe, probably intermarry into the tribe, and you've got uh, sort of an Indian-African-American mix that then gets shipped to Oklahoma. Well, they didn't like Oklahoma any better than anybody else did, but they had the guts to get the heck out. So they headed south into Mexico, where they begin to learn Spanish, intermarry with the Mexicans. So now you've got a third racial group, linguistic group coming on. You now speak Seminole, Cherokee, English, Mexi Mexican Spanish. 
And then they start coming back up into Texas when the 9th Cavalry starts working along the, the Rio Grande River at like Fort Clark down around uh, Uvalde. And since they know so much about the country, and since they, they have all these skills, they become the scouts for the 9th Cavalry. And then when they arrive at Fort Davis, they become the scouts for the 10th Cavalry. So the Seminole scouts already lived with the Lipan Apaches and the, the Kikapu Indians in North Mexico. They knew the habits of the Apaches. They knew how to find them. They knew how to find where the water holes were and this sort of thing. The Seminoles were invaluable scouts. The, uh, the Buffalo soldiers accepted them fairly well because they kind of looked like them. You know, here's a guy that's part African American, part Native American, like most of the people I know in College Station. <laughs> so, so, uh, so the Seminoles are, the reason that there's a town in West Texas named Seminole is in honor of the Seminole scouts who were very pivotal in, in uh, making sure that we could deal with the Apaches in that area. And, and here you see the Apaches out in the mountains looking down on the cavalry down below. How in the world they got into that position, God and Victorio only know. And here's some of the Apaches in Victorio's troop taken at the time. That's what they looked like. That's the real deal. Here's uh, Buffalo soldiers guarding the overland mail, the Butterfield stage, coming across Olympia Creek into Fort Davis. This is a painting, but that's pretty accurate. And here they are in a skirmish with the Apache, and you'll notice there's nothing there. I mean, that's sand and rocks, and you know, there's nothing to get behind. So you, uh, you, you do the best you can, but they didn't turn and run. The desertion rate of the Buffalo Soldiers is the lowest desertion rate by percentage of any military troop in the United States ever. These guys stayed the course. And here's one of them, he's got the, the stagecoach horse has been shot out from under the stagecoach. That's all he's got for breastworks. He's shooting, but notice, he's aiming. Those guys running around out there just kind of shooting, yeehaw! And he's out back here, he's picking one of them off at a time, you know, like ducks. So he might actually have made it out of there because there are probably some other buffalo soldiers coming on behind and probably got the situation out of control, okay? Here's the Apache lifestyle. They, they live in a thing called a wikiup, you see in the background. They, that, and that's, they're made out of like Ocotillo uh, spines and with uh, whatever they could find thrown over it. Here's uh, some Apache kids and a little Mexican boy that was an orphan that they stole, <laughs> which is kind of the, one of the things that the Apaches would do is adopt, sort of forcibly adopt. These, I, I'm not sure who these guys are, but their names like Chata, Mangus, uh, Geronimo, uh, and that's probably who these are. These were the, the great Apache war chiefs, uh, and, and they, they were a formidable foe. But the very last thing that Victorio did, he was uh, in 1878, I believe, somewhere in my notes I've got the actual date. He was, uh, not that it matters, <laughs> it's, it's now 2015, right? Anyway, he's, uh, after 10 years of fighting with the Army, He's coming up from Mexico, tries to make it all the way back to New Mexico. Grierson scouts, the Seminole scouts, find out he's coming. Grierson gets to Rattlesnake Springs before he does, sets up an ambush, has troops coming in from uh, Fort Bliss and back uh, east from Fort Davis. Everybody's kind of coming together. Victorio comes into the trap, but at the last minute senses the trap turns around, runs out. I don't think very many warriors were killed. I don't think any Buffalo soldiers were killed. They got out of the trap, headed into Mexico, down to a, a mountainous place in Chihuahua called Tres Castillas, where General Terraza, so the Mexican army, finally caught him. Most of the horses either dead or lame, no supplies, no bullets left, uh, hadn't had water for days, and he killed Victorio. So that was the end of the Apache resistance in Texas. Now Geronimo continued to play a role out in, in Arizona, but we're done in Texas. We've got everything under control. The United States now owns the Central Plains and Texas. The overland mail is safe all the way to El Paso, and that's all we came to do. Well now, the Buffalo soldiers get sent to Arizona, but we're going to leave them. <laughs> we're going to let them go. And, uh, come up to the modern time. This is the parking lot of the fort. This is probably taken in the, in the uh, 19, late 1950s. Uh, 
And these are some people that uh, may seem somewhat familiar to you. This is the Overland Trail, by the way. This is Overland Trail Street in Fort Davis. The buildings in the background are the Overland Trail Museum, which is a really interesting place, I understand, but I've never been there when it was open because Fort Davis is such a small town, it's kind of open whenever they feel like it. <laughs> but th th this road goes down to the fort, and that's Sally Side Saddle and me and uh, Mary Fenton, the lady that has us come out there. These are the largent girls, uh, the daughters of a ranching family there that Sally outfitted with these period costumes and side saddles. And they're riding side saddle on the parade ground in front of Grierson's house in that picture. And there's yours truly on the right and Sally in the middle and Mary Fenton on the left. They're both riding side saddle and I'm riding in more or less period rancher costume of, of the 1890s. And this is a, I'm, I'm told that this statue or sculpture is at Fort Leavenworth. I thought it was at Fort Sill. But this is a sculpture in honor of the Buffalo Soldier at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. If you get a chance to go see the fort, you need to go see the sculpture. This is a Buffalo Soldier in bronze, forevermore to be remembered their contribution to the settling of the state of Texas. Thank you.